be on. All right, thank you very much. And now I'm very happy to be able to hand over to Russell, please. Thanks, Conrad. Thanks to Conrad and uh, John for organizing this workshop. Um, many, many years ago, I gave a talk in Knoxville, Tennessee. And after the talk, uh, someone came up to me very enthusiastically and said, loved your talk, Russell. Couldn't understand a word you said, um, but really liked the pictures. <laughs> and I guess that was rubbing my nose mm -hmm. in the fact that despite the fact that you know I was speaking English and they were speaking English, and that, that I had just gone from New Zealand to another kind of weird country, the, the, the US, there was cultural kind of difference. Um, and that there was kind of cultural miscommunication. Uh, and that was just a microscopic thing that I think would strike an alien. Imagine an alien came to, to visit us and to study us. And they got out their clipboard, looked around and go, humans, hmm, interesting species. You know, typically one head, two arms, two legs. But oh my goodness, 7,000 odd different languages and worshipping thousands and thousands of gods. This species is quite interesting. What's striking about it is that although there's relatively little variation in the kind of underlying biology, there's massive variation culturally. Um, and whoops, and uh, that's, this is just to kind of illustrate the enormous diversity of cultures uh, across our kind of planet, and that that kind of cultural diversity is also mirrored in the diversity of gods and beliefs and religious practices. Now, um, in the 60s and 70s, there was you know a veritable industry in anthropology of comparative cross-cultural studies. Um, but then along came postmodernism and various other kinds of um, things, and it became deeply unfashionable to do comparative cross-cultural work. It was seen, uh, basically, you had to understand societies in their, in their own terms. Uh, to try and compare across cultures was seen as, as highly suspect uh, and you know, perhaps p politically kind of immoral. Um, I think that situation's changing now. Uh, it's changing in part because of the critique within kind of psychology uh, of the focus on, on just weird uh, societies, uh, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and, and, and democratic. And so I think increasingly people are, are looking again to, to engaging with diversity, engaging with cross-cultural comparative work. So this talk is going to be um, uh, basically uh, an account of some of the pleasures and some of the pitfalls in doing uh, comparative cross-cultural work. So let's begin with the problems of sampling. Uh, this is Sumatra. Um, and the first question that confronts people when they want to compare cultures is what are the units? And this isn't really just a problem that's unique to anthropology. Uh, biologists, you know, argue forever about what a species uh, is. Linguists argue forever about what's the difference in a language and a dialect. So the question of what is the, the unit of comparison is quite a tricky one. And there'll be different kinds of units that people might want to focus on for, for, for different pur uh, purposes. So you could regard Sumatra uh, as uh, a unit. Um, and uh, that then, if you were to say about, say, its religious and political history, over the last thousand years, it's been involved in three different kingdoms and uh, colonized by uh, three different colonial kind of forces. So you might want to narrow down uh, your focus, not just on Sumatra in the last thousand years, but perhaps to uh, one of those kingdoms, um, or you might want to uh, narrow down the units into some smaller cultural group, because there's a range of different cultural practices uh, across Sumatra uh, and uh, quite an array of different languages. One cultural group is the, the Tabo Bartak, so you could narrow in within Sumatra uh, on, on that group. And uh, you could focus in just uh, on uh, one kind of linguistic community within that uh, broader uh, 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 Talabartak group. So what I'm just trying to point out is there are choices here. It's not immediately obvious 
uh, what the appropriate unit should be. And that, that will often depend on the kind of questions that you want to ask and the kind of theories you want to test. Um, so I've been involved uh, particularly with these two uh, fantastic scholars, Joseph Watts and Oliver Sheehan, with building up a, a database of religious beliefs and practices uh, in, in the Pacific. Uh, Palotu, Palotu in Samoan means uh, abode of the gods. So I think we currently have uh, data from 137 uh, cultures, so we're, we're taking a unit to be a kind of culture, um, uh, across the, the Pacific. Now, uh, how do we exactly define what is a culture? So our definition uh, is a group of people living in a similar physical, social, and economic environment that speak a mutually intelligible language and have relatively homogenous supernatural beliefs and practices. So essentially, we are looking at ethno-linguistically defined groups. And sometimes the Pacific makes life easy because uh, you've got all these islands, so you've got a sort of geographically circumscribed thing. But as I showed with the island of Sumatra, that doesn't always make the problem of what are the units uh, go away. Uh, but that's just one set of particular mythological, mythological choices. If you look at the a range of different databases that, that are out there, um, uh, say from EREF to the database of religious histories to, to Shishat, to uh, the Natural History of Song database project, there's lots of different kind of choices that, that, that people uh, uh, are making. And with certain kinds of choices, there comes certain benefits and certain kinds of problems. So one of the problems with Palotu is that uh, we've mainly focused on kind of uh, a space and time focus that's kind of pre-modern, the sort of uh, prior to um, uh, or at the time when European uh, colonizers arrived in the Pacific. We do have uh, a small amount of data in Palotu uh, on current kind of modes of religious beliefs and practices and some information on the middle, but it's fundamentally not a historical database. Uh, what about some of the other projects? Well, uh, CSHAT, for example, its units are quite different. They are so-called natural geographic areas. I'm never quite sure what a natural geographic area is because that, that are obvious to, to me. Um, the, uh, you might think islands describe a natural geographic area, uh, but actually in the Pacific there was an enormous amount of exchange and trade between even these very far-flung kind of islands. So for the Polynesians, the Pacific, the ocean wasn't really a, a moat, it was a kind of highway that they communicated uh, uh, across extensively. Uh, so what is a boundary to, to some human populations uh, might not be a boundary to others given different kinds of technology. So I think the, the, the choice of these so-called natural geographic units is a, is a bit problematic. Similarly, uh, the focus within these is, is on kind of polities. And uh, if you look at the, the data that's in CSHAT, sometimes you can see apparently dramatic changes that happen within one of these units. And it's because different cultural groups move in. So what looks like a discontinuity from the point of view of geography might actually be continuity if you were tracking the cultures rather than the geographic areas. So again, there's kind of choices there. Uh, another database, uh, the database of religious history, uh, makes rather different kinds of choices about what its units are. Uh, some of its units range from, I think there's, there's one sample that's a group of uh, religious community in New York of about uh, 300 people and studied over a range of about 37 years. So that's sort of a very specific, narrow, very specific group and a very specific and narrow uh, place and time. But there's also very large units in there. I think there's uh, a central African group that um, isn't over, th studied over 300 years, but studied over 1800 years and includes what are now seven different kind of nation states. Now, I find that a bit problematic because when it comes to doing the analysis, you're essentially gonna be comparing potentially very different kinds of, kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, in the database of religious history now, um, I'm actually on the advisory board, so I've been sort of talking to them a bit about this, but they, they, they have the, these different kinds of units. They also have religious places and just places in general, and they're also moving to include uh, objects, religious kind of objects. Now, 
uh, I think in general they realize that having the very broad geographic units is, is not going to be helpful uh, and th they're focusing on much more uh, specific uh, uh, narrower places and uh, time periods. Okay, so choosing units comes with benefits and also certain kinds of costs. What about uh, coding culture? For many people, the idea that you can take the incredibly rich and complex fabric of human social life and somehow put it in a data matrix is just an appallingly horrible kind of thing. You know, the, 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 the ethnographic atlas was uh, once described as tabulated nonsense. Um, uh, but uh, all science requires some kinds of abstraction and, and simplification. And that if you're not prepared to do that, then you're not really going to be able to uh, compare cultures. And it's, it's not as impossible as, as some social anthropologists might uh, have us believe. Um, uh, but there are varying degrees of difficulty. Uh, this is two images of Fiji. Uh, now, if I had to code kind of house shape, that's going to be relatively uh, uncontentious. Uh, you can code whether it's you know, square or rectangular or circular. You can code what kind of material was used to make, make the roof. That's going to be able to be done reasonably reliably. Uh, over on the right, we have a rather infamous uh, Fijian chief who I think uh, might hold the world record for the number of people he's had eaten, um, over 900, I think. Um, and the chiefly system poses certain problems in terms of coding it. Uh, one of the things that people often want to code about religious and political systems is the kind of levels of hierarchy. Now, uh, there's the Ratu system in Fiji, and there, there is various levels of complexity. Now, in, in some parts of Fiji, there, there will be um, a paramount chief that is uh, responsible for uh, like a, a relatively small community, but in other uh, parts of Fiji, there will be this, again, a kind of paramount chief, but there are chiefs below him. So should you code, say, Bowen Fijian as having um, two levels of, of, of political hierarchy, common people, chiefs, and then these paramount chiefs, or, or just one level of political hierarchy? Or should you code them as having both? Or should you code the most commonly used form or the highest form? There again, there are kind of methodological choices there. And similarly, when it comes to, to coding uh, uh, religious beliefs, the, it's gonna be a lot harder than uh, to do that consistently in a way that actually accurately captures what's, what's happening, uh, much harder than, than house shape. So uh, that, from my point of view, should be a, a bit of a warning, a bit of a caveat uh, about that when we turn to uh, ethnographic uh, databases, what's in there about religion might not be as reliable and as useful as what might be in there about house uh, shapes. There's a lot of debate, uh, well, there has been uh, some rather personalized debate, perhaps a more accurate way of putting it, uh, about what's the best way of building these databases. Should you get uh, kind of the, the, the known authorities to provide you information that uh, informs your database, or should you use a team of uh, research assistants to, to go out and, and, and gather that data? And the, the, the database of religious history very much uh, went with the expert model, uh, and the CSHAP very much went with the, the RA data. And obviously there are costs and, and, and benefits of, of doing both. Uh, it's much harder to get experts to, to give you data. You can gather a lot of data a lot faster using research assistants, but I know the, the historians that work with the database of religious history are extremely skeptical about a lot of the quality of the, the RA data that's in, 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 in CSHAP. Uh, I just want to point out that you don't necessarily have to go between either of those kind of choices. There's, there's sort of hybrid models that are, that are possible. And uh, I'm uh, involved in a project called Grandbank where we uh, are coding 195 grammatical features for, uh, we have data now for over 2,500 languages across the world. Um, and we use a hybrid between research assistants and, and um, 
experts. So what we do is we have actually a kind of a global group of young folk who love reading grammars. Uh, but uh, so in some ways they're like RAs, but they're highly educated RAs. Uh, but each feature has a, its patron, an expert that really knows about this feature. And they communicate on a daily basis, because I get all the updates, uh, on, on GitHub. And so you get a kind of constant feedback between the, the globally distributed RAs and the kind of experts. And uh, one of the benefits of that is that you can, then I'm contrasting uh, a former database of, gram of grammatical or typological features, the word is of language structures, and uh, if you look, here's the number of languages and here's the amount of data they have, essentially their data matrix is 80% empty because it was hard to get the experts to give them all the data. So you'd have some experts that provided them with a, you know, a lot of information and, and some that provided them with very little information on just a very small number of features. But by using this hybrid model, we've been able to get, uh, I think, the benefits of both worlds. Okay, so that's some problems about um, units uh, and about coding of, of culture. Uh, I want to move on and, and cover this relatively briefly about what do you do when the information you want isn't in the ethnographic sources. I, I see some smiles, I, I see some frowns. You probably know where this is going. This is going to the 61%. Yes, you might have heard about the, uh, the paper that was published in the journal Nature by Harvey Whitehouse and colleagues that had 61% you know, missing data. And uh, what they did was to decide that uh, where they couldn't get any information, they would kind of recode that as, as being absence, the absence of a moralizing God. Uh, and as a number of us pointed out in, in our kind of response, that totally determined, their treatment of missing data totally determined the answer that they got. And after a very lengthy period of time, uh, nature finally made them uh, retract their, their, their paper. And, and just to show you, uh, it wasn't just the problem that the data was missing, 61% of it, but the, the missingness was temporally structured and therefore uh, no amount of clever data imputation or anything like that could rescue their, their, their analysis. So actually this is now, this is from a textbook. This has become a textbook example of I guess of what not to do. Um, this is from Richard McKellie's book, uh, Statistical Rethinking, page 514, here it is. And what he's done is, is plot uh, over time uh, and, and, and with population size, uh, blue shows the presence of moralizing gods. Uh, the uh, X's show uh, that uh, they're unknown and uh, open circles show uh, moralizing gods are absent. Now what they'd done, because it, it all depended on the kind of timing, uh, what they'd done is conclude that uh, moralizing gods came after the, an increase in political complexity. But look at where all their data is, is missing. It's from the earlier time period. So um, it's, it's I, I don't really know how they could have made such a fundamental mistake. And I, mean, I don't really understand how reviewers could have, could have missed that. Because if you think about it, uh, what's the underlying cause? Why was that, that data missing? Well, if you look at what they have uh, in their sample for Hawaii, it becomes very, very clear. Uh, the, for Hawaii, they had, over a range of different time periods, you know, no moralizing God. And then all of a sudden, in 1800, they have a moralizing God. Now, did Hawaiian society uh, radically transform then? No, people came along who could write it down. And the, the sort of the fundamental problem is that the, 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 you, you, it's really hard to make evidence, to make inferences about moralizing gods if you only got kind of archeological uh, evidence, if you haven't got records of, of writing. So a major problem, I think, with their, their, their database is the, in terms of the, the temporal trajectory, uh, you, you can get different kinds of information from different sources. And if you want to get information about religious beliefs and practices, having written sources is obviously a lot better than just straight archeological sources. Okay, enough about, one more thing. But sometimes, so in this case, I think it was an entirely unwarranted 
uh, inference that uh, to code things where they had no evidence as evidence of absence. But there might be times when that's actually not a bad inference. Say, for example, if you have rich ethnographic sources and you, you uh, want to make inferences about whether there was a high god, now, that's typically the kind of thing that ethnographers would, would definitely want to note down. So I think in that particular case, if no mention is made of a high god in you know, detailed ethnographies, then it's not a bad inference that there, there weren't high gods. So it depends on the sources. I think back to the point that you're making, we have to worry about our sources, where the data comes from. Okay, reliability. You know, is it the case that you know, the data in the Ethnic Africa Atlas is all tabulated nonsense? What do we know about the, the reliability of it? Well, um, let's think about uh, Murdoch's coding of uh, um, uh, a high god. I think it's problematic because it combines lots of different heterogeneous things. And uh, for example, a high god could be defined as uh, an entity that created all reality, that created other spirits, that was the ultimate governor of reality, or that controlled the, the natural world. Now those things are, are not equivalent, and evidence for one doesn't necessarily imply evidence for other. Uh, and what it means is that when people go to the ethnographic record with a rather different definition of a high god, they, they're going to uh, count it in, in, in rather different kinds of ways. Um, and uh, hit this, I've uh, kindly been lent this slide from a recent talk at the Cultural Evolution Society by uh, Joshua Jackson and, and colleagues. And what they've been doing is, is going through, they're building their own uh, ethnographic database of religious beliefs and practices, a global one. And what they've been doing is going through and comparing their coding uh, with rather different and more specific definitions versus kind of Murdoch's. And what they notice is that in four different cultures, uh, they would say there's evidence of something that fits their definition of a high god where Mur Murdoch had coded it uh, as, as absinthe. Um, so I think particularly when it comes to religious beliefs and practices, uh, I, I would want to go back to the original ethnographic sources rather than rely on what's in the, in the ethnographic uh, atlas. I think increasingly there is more careful work. When I was preparing this talk, I came across this database project that I didn't know about, uh, done from some folk uh, at, at Oxford, uh, uh, um, I think led by Robin Dunbar and, and Joseph Watts and colleagues on hunter-gatherer religions uh, spread across the world. And as I mentioned, uh, coming soon hopefully is uh, a, a sort of new and improved kind of global database of uh, religious beliefs uh, led by uh, Josh Jackson, Joseph Watts, and Ben Pazuki, who probably lots of you know. And I think they'll have been a lot more careful about, about definitions, about sources, uh, and in particular, uh, given Ben's interests about metadata, and we'll, we'll come to that a bit more about why that's important. Actually, we'll come to it right now. Because <laughs> uh, so far I've been talking about validity, if, uh, about reliability, if, different people go to the same sources, do they come back with the same kinds of answers? But an even more fundamental concern is like how good are the underlying uh, ethnographic sources? Uh, and this is rather well covered in uh, a recent paper by Joseph Watts and, 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 and colleagues, including uh, Ben Pazurki, um, that I highly recommend to, to everybody. And what they point out is that there's lots of reasons why the, the, the data uh, that's in ethnography or the treatments in ethnography might have particular kinds of biases. For example, if the sources were missionaries, they come with particular kind of worldviews. And uh, often particularly missionaries are very keen on sort of reinterpreting local gods uh, in an Abrahamic way. There was always a search for something that was equivalent to uh, an Abrahamic god. And I know in the case of, of Maori in New Zealand, the, the like initial claims were that they had something like an Abrahamic god, uh, when actually that's just not historically kind of accurate. There's work showing that there's gender bias in ethnographies. Uh, men tend to report more inequality between men and women than women do. I think that's an interesting kind of kind of bias. Um, there's also well-known tendencies to sort of exoticize uh, uh, various kinds of cultures. So 
what uh, Ben and, and Joseph and, and Joshua and people now emphasize is that alongside the data, it's really important to have metadata about, uh, say, the length of time that the researchers spent in the field, who they, who they were, um, what kind of, kind of theoretical orientations they were coming from. And then that kind of metadata can be used, can factor it into the analysis in terms of possible uh, sources of, of bias. Okay, transparency. We live, I think, for the good, in, in an increasingly uh, scientific context which emphasizes the importance of, of open science, of being able to reproduce analyses, of having the process by which the data is generated and analyzed, you know, transparent and, and, and reproducible. Uh, and that hasn't always been the case for, for lots of these uh, cross-cultural projects. It was, it was not a concern typically of the people who were working in the, in the 60s and, and 70s. Um, so just to give you an example about how you can really try and make those processes uh, as transparent and, and reproducible as possible, I'll show you a bit about what we're doing with the Grand Bank project. So I mentioned that the, um, the Grand Bank coders all w communicate on GitHub, so, uh, and we have a kind of wiki there, so each feature has its own wiki, and also we record and link to that uh, all the discussion that goes on between the, the coders and the um, uh, the feature patron, so that when people uh, access the Grand Bank data, they can click on a feature and click on a particular language, and they can see the, not only the exact page source that that reference came from, but all the discussion that might have gone on about that particular data point. Uh, and to me, that's, that's really important, because what it means is you can, um, uh, Yes, you're summarizing things in a table, but still you can demonstrate all the kind of rich scholarship that goes into every single data point. So you don't have this kind of false choice between the sort of quantitative and, and the qualitative. And one of the things we're doing is just using the length of discussion uh, as a proxy for the, the amount of certainty or uncertainty there is about each of the features. So some features turn out to be really quite hard to code and they've produced a vast amount of discussion on, on the GitHub. So we can use that as a kind of, uh, a kind of proxy in our analyses to factor in uh, just how confident people can be about the coding. And we, we did some fun things on the reliability of the, the coding. Uh, we, we first of all got different experts to code across all these features. And experts just want to disagree. They're just disagreeable. They want to kind of dispute the kind of categories and, and, and things. And so the, the experts um, were at about 85% uh, agreement mm -hmm. on how they would code grammatical features. Now, interestingly, with our current Grand Bank coders, with this process, this kind of hybrid model, uh, they agree about 90% of the time when we have them independently code the, the, the grammars. So I actually think that's better than the, the experts working in this kind of hybrid way. Okay, so I've talked a bit about uh, transparency. Uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, non-independence. That uh, and why? Well, here's uh, an influential paper uh, published by Dominic Johnson that tested the sort of supernatural punishment hypothesis. And he used the, the Santa Cross cultural sample to do that, uh, 186 cultures across the world. Now, those of you that might have heard me talk before might know where I'm going with this. Isn't it cool? 186 cultures, that's great, but. Uh, you might recognize this person uh, here, Galton, because Galton famously had a problem with comparing cultures in, in, in this kind of way. Um, there was a talk in, ooh, 1871, was it? I think, um, by Edward Tyler. Yes, no, 1888. Uh, on the 13th of November at the British uh, Institute for Anthropology. Uh, and Tyler was giving this talk where, interestingly, he did this kind of cross-cultural analysis looking about post-marital residence patterns um, uh, and what was he connecting them with? Uh, oh, I forget. Um, anyhow, he was doing this comparative analysis. And there was the president of the society, uh, Francis Galton, who annoyingly put up his hand uh, at the end of the talk and, and asked the kind of bastard question, um, which was, 
Uh, that full information should be given to the degree to which the customs and tribes and races, which the term race, um, uh, which are being compared together are independent. Might it be that some of the tribes have derived them from a common source so that they were duplicate copies of the original? In other words, it's wrong statistically to treat cultures as independent. They can be related through patterns of, of descent. So how do we deal with the non-independence of, of, of cultures? Well, using tools for evolutionary biology, uh, we can uh, factor in their non-independence by using kind of phylogenies. So here's some work uh, that Joseph Watts and uh, myself and other colleagues did where we looked at uh, ritual human sacrifice uh, and its uh, r relationship to the evolution of uh, stratified societies. So these are Austronesian societies, and the, the, the tree here, the phylogenetic tree, is derived from, uh, it's, it's a language-based, uh, basically a cavity-based language tree. So we're not treating them as independent, we're modeling the coupled evolution of these features uh, on this phylogeny. And what we could show was that uh, having ritual uh, human sacrifice substantially increased the probability of ratcheting up stratified societies. And we can do that in a way that it took into account the, the non-independence of the cultures. Now that's all, that's all kind of nice, but there's another kind of non-independence, that things are not only non-independent because of genealogy, they can be non-independent because of geography. Uh, so uh, if you, to be properly worried about non-independence, you should also control not just for genealogy, but geography. So here's some work that we're currently doing where we're testing claims about linguistic universals. So, uh, many people think that human psychology imposes fundamental constraints on the way in which uh, languages can evolve such that there'll be uh, universal uh, patterns in, in, in language. So what we did in this work, uh, which is not published yet, was take 191 of these putative uh, linguistic universals and test them using methods that controlled for, for geography and kind of genealogy. And the kind of the brief answer is that we uh, only found uh, kind of good statistical support for about half of those putative 191 uh, linguistic universals. So controlling for, for, for space and controlling for genealogy really matters. Okay, I thought I'd finish off with uh, a case study. I'm trying to put some of these things together. A recent study led by uh, Oliver Sheehan, uh, just I think came out a week or so ago in the journal um, Nature Human Behavior. And in this work, what we're trying to do is test what the relationship is between uh, secular and religious uh, authority. So the sort of question we're asking is, to what extent do religious and political authority co-evolve? So we'd looked, say, in the past at the relationship between uh, the evolution of certified societies and ritual human sacrifice. What we're doing here is asking what's the kind of co-evolutionary relationship between these two forms uh, of authority, and does one have kind of causal, causal precedence? Do you get religious authority first, or do you get political authority first? Now, how do we differentiate those? Uh, well, following fifth, um, I'll just, I'll just read the quote. Both politics and religion imply an awareness of social relationships and emphasize integration. Politics, the concern for order in society, and religion, the concern for congregational bonds. But whereas politics is focused on relations uh, of men and women with uh, other people, religion is more uh, orientated to relations of people with gods or other spiritually for forces. So there's a sort of principled way of, of demarcating these two. Now, uh, for some people, religion comes first. Uh, this is the view that's very strongly expressed in the book by David Graeber and Marshall Salins, where they say that as a corollary, there are no secular authorities. Human power is spiritual power. So religion comes kind of first. That contrasts with Robert Canero's view, who argues that political authority comes first, uh, often forged in, in warfare uh, through military might, and then subsequently kind of legitimized perhaps with uh, religious kind of means. There is a third view, which says a plague on both these houses, the religious and political hierarchy, authority kind of go together and are sort of often inextricably linked. That's the view that Morris Block um, 
uh, articulated. So how do we go about testing uh, this? So uh, following Weber and uh, Uphoff, we define authority as a form of social power that is vested in culturally recognized role or office that is exercised over a specific group of people. So these are our sort of operational definitions. A religious authority is the right to manage interactions between living human beings and supernatural agents or powers, and political authority is the right to uh, manage interactions between living human beings. So, and this is going to interestingly contrast with some of the past work that I've talked about, where, to the horror of many people, we just binarize, binarize cultural features that are by the presence or absence. So using some new methods, what we're able to do is test for correlated evolution with uh, sort of more graded scales. So we're, we've got uh, uh, four levels of religious authority, it being absent or very restricted, sublocal, local, or, or supralocal. And political authority, uh, again, uh, at similar kinds of distinctions, a similar graded scale. So our focus, as it often is, was on the Austronesian cultures of the Pacific, which have, in many ways, are just like a wonderful, as it's often said, kind of natural laboratory for, for cultural evolution. Uh, and so here you can see the, and, and this, you know, quite striking variation in religious authority and political authority uh, across the Austronesian uh, uh, spread. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Austronesian cultures can be traced back to about 5,000 years ago to, to, to Taiwan. There uh, was a movement then to uh, the Philippines and then a very rapid movement uh, all the way up to Madagascar, but also to the very far reaches of the Pacific. So this is uh, you know, a, a cultural radiation that's happened in the last 5,000 years. What we find when we analyze this using uh, phylogenetic methods, uh, well, before we use phylogenetic methods, uh, people used to do these contingency tables. Uh, but this is bad, of course, because it doesn't control for non-independence. But if you just look at this contingency table here, what you can see is that the majority of entries are along the, the diagonal, that there appears to be a strong correlation between as you increase political authority, you also increase religious authority. Now, using some uh, new methods that uh, Eric Ringen has developed, we can test in this kind of graded way whether the uh, evolution of these features is coupled and which one is driving uh, which one. Here is a summary phylogenetic tree of these Austronesian cultures, and you can see the, the, the different states mapped onto the tips of it. Uh, religious authority here and political authority here, and if you look roughly, you can see that the colors very often kind of match up. They are tightly coupled. And when we do the, the more specific inference to try and find out which one is driving, which one, the answer is we can't discriminate. The, the both seem to be driving e each other. Uh, this is a, a kind of estimate of if there's a unit change uh, in um, religious authority uh, is what's the likelihood of change in political authority. And you can see it, it's kind of strongly positive. That, and similarly, the estimate is almost exactly the same. If there's an increase in political authority, what's the probability of change in religious authority? And it's almost exactly the same. We can't discriminate between the two. So what does this mean? Well, the view that religion comes first, that seems wrong. The view that politics comes first, that seems wrong. And Morris Bloch's view that these things are inextricably intertwined, that seems to be the, the winner from our analysis. Uh, but I promised the pleasures and pitfalls, and I should just finish up by noting a lot of caveats. You know, first of all, we've reduced the complexity of religious and political authority <laughs> into these kind of four state um, ordinal variables. Secondly, our focus is just on uh, Austronesian cultures. So you know, be careful about generalizing to uh, you know, cultures all around the world. And in particular, there's relatively few examples in Austronesia of what you'd call states. Hawaii was sometimes called like a proto-state, but there's um, only moderately complex political units. Uh, our focus was uh, on kind of pre-colonial uh, times, pre uh, um, ethnographic, the ethnographic past, and on societies that haven't been converted to kind of global religions. So uh, I think being careful, we need to emphasize all those limitations of the study. Hopefully, 
What I've done is show you uh, some of the pleasures and some of the perils of comparative cross-cultural work. Thank you. I have like 100 questions. We're gonna ask one to begin with, which is on your last point, the, 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 the focus on this study on pre-conversion to world religions. So does that, does that mean that you're not counting uh, like the, the Malay archipelago before the advent of either one or both of Hinduism and Islam? That, that's the, the coding there is, is quite tricky. So what we, bec um, so, because I can remember looking at those and it, it seems, I remember when we were doing the high gods work and there were local names, but it seemed like the kind of concept of a high god had been imported kind of in. So we had a long discussion about how we should actually kind of code, yeah. code that. Um, so um, for this work, I'm just going back to the map. So yes, we've got quite a few through Malaysia. I think that, I, I, I can't remember the exact coding on this, but I think it would be after the, so pre-colonial, uh, uh, kind of European colonization, colonial empires, but post the influence from. Oh, so after the 8th century. Yeah. Right, okay. Interesting, All right. Okay. So again, that's a kind of space and time focus. If we, if we had ethnographic data from earlier, mm -hmm. that would be interesting to kind of to put that into the analysis, but yeah, we, but we the don't. The sources are so unreliable. Yes, exactly, that, yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. Question, please. I have a question, but you may never have to answer it. So um, I'm curious with the new database, the new ethnographic database, if they are trying to deal with, so you know, you, you talked about the, the bias, um, the bias of against like there's just less information on women and how are they are they actually trying to deal with this or is it like is this even possible because I mean you know even now um, if I go to a place like Fiji I'm going to find out completely different information than if you go to a place like Fiji because different people will talk to us <laughs> so like I'm wondering like is there a solution to this problem because I don't <laughs> yeah so I think I think. Having talked briefly to Ben about this, and I think what he would say is that you probably want to do two analyses then. I mean, I, I don't think there's a perfect solution because you're, you, you're just going to have different sources of information, and you're, you're totally right. I notice that when we do linguistic work in Vanuatu, the, 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 the woman linguists, you know, they have to go off to the woman end of the village and the male linguists have to go there, and they, they're getting just different kinds of information. So uh, th there's no escaping kind of gender on, on this. Um, the, uh, so I think what Ben would say, minimally, you should be then running two kinds of analyses. You should, you should run them separately, and that's why he keeps emphasizing having the metadata to you know, in, investigate at least potential kind of biases. And I, I don't think you can remove them, but you can show their effect. Hmm. Yeah, this is, this is a problem I've, because I think like we're missing huge chunks of religion or just because women have less <laughs> less likely to have done this work historically and it's it's kind of sad. Yeah. I can pass my phone. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about this Marduk atlas. Um, the Marduk's atlas of um, uh, anthropology or, of, of world, cu world cultures because historians are quite often using this atlas. Which one? The um, Mardox. Oh, Mardox, yes. Yeah. Okay, the ethnographic. Yes. Um, because it, it's there, so it's quite easy to, it was published and uh, everybody got access to that. So there were some studies ab made by economical historians, which were trying, for example, Sarah Carmichael, they were trying to create this index of uh, some social behavior in all the cultures uh, described by Mardock and some other uh, studies. And at the end, it's, uh, it's just rubbish. Because, for example, they're trying to describe to European cultures, looking for this, uh, because usually in, in this atlas, the, uh, the given culture is described, uh, in the European context, is described by, by this, uh, the most rural and most far from the capital uh, culture that they could find. So at the end, the Norway or, 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 
Russia is described, but by these cultures that weren't important in the development of these countries. But then, in that, that's the problem. There's the problem that sometimes people are trying to use this data to describe the modern day countries. And if you know that you are describing those other cultures before the colonization, um, you are in much better situation. But the fact that a lot of people are taking this anthropological data bef without this all the knowledge about the way that this data was gathered, without the knowledge why the anthropologists are interested in this kind of the societies, create a lot of problems. But at lo as long as you could publish that, uh, uh, people are not very worried about that. Yeah. Well, they should be. <laughs> that's that's all like. That's probably, and I, th I think at least. Um, well, I happen to be talking to an editor of Science Advances, and you know, the, um, they were saying that they were very reluctant to publish anything that, that, that drew on the ethnographic atlas because they were very skeptical about the quality of data in there. Um, and uh, I guess what I was trying to say in my talk is that I'd be much more skeptical of certain kinds of data in there. I'm not going to be so skeptical about their, their house design data, but I think a lot of the data on religious beliefs and practices um, is not great. I, I think a lot of the data on things like, say, patterns of post-marital residence and kinship, that would be much better if we had uh, not just a, a kind of summary state, but, but estimates of relative frequency, so variability. Because um, that's that, that's not really in like a lot of aspects of the ethnographic atlas. So, yeah, it's we can do better, and like I think these folk will definitely do better. All right, I've got a fairly straightforward question, perhaps. Uh, that last piece of work that you showed, the case study, uh, do you think that speaks to Ara's work on the big gods? Uh, we weren't really, no, I'm kind of bored with the whole big gods kind of <laughs> thing. Um, where is it? No, because we, we, we just, we were asking, because there's been these, you know, reasonably long-standing debates about what's the relation to between politics and religion, right? Right. That, that's what we were, you know, trying to get at using this Austronesian. So you're not interested in big gods, you're interested in big priests. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think it's it's a, a different set of questions. Sure. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I know. So this has nothing to do with religion. So like pedagogically, and actually in like in the book I just wrote, I like I use to to illustrate Galton's problem or. or version of Galton's problem, the sort of question of how you, how you attribute cross-cultural similarity to different sets of causes. Like, I, I use two examples uh, to represent two options. One is the kind of like Rua, Dua, right, the number two, right, uh, thing. And then the other, like, is, is the kind of Mama example. Should I stop doing that? I, like, I, but I don't know, like, because I, I tried looking up work on whether or not there is, the, whether or not we should still think that the, the, the use of Mama to refer to, for example, Mothers, but in some cases, fathers comes from the kind, a kind of like ease of, of the way your mouth moves and all the rest of it. Uh, but like, I, I couldn't find any very recent work on on that. Like, do, do you agree on this? There's a lovely paper by uh, Damien Blasi and colleagues that show that the putative uh, arbitrariness of form and meaning in, in, in language, the, 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 there's quite a lot less arbitrariness than people sometimes might think. And so, like the, 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 the mama kind of example that I, that I think the point you're getting at is that the sort of convergence on kind of baby talk. So you can get these parallels, but they're the parallels due to the kind of processes of language acquisition and human cognition rather than being kind of reflecting genealogy. I take it that's the point you were getting right, at. Yeah. And so there's this nice paper by Damien Blasky and colleagues that, that shows there's, there's quite a lot more uh, non-arbitrariness, if you like, uh, oh, in aspects of, of language. So um, let me try and see if I can give you an example. Uh, in Maori, uh, roto means something like lake. Uh, now, which one of these is a big lake and which one is a little lake? Roto iti or roto nui? Iti is small. Iti is small, yes. Okay, so and it turns out with you know things like I at the end tend to be smaller, so that's I think an example of the kind, and that's you know cross linguistically like robust. It's like a version of the boo boo kiki effect, is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what's the, what's the name of the guy? The Damien Blasi. 
Sorry, I just can't remember where it was published. Cool, that's but great. So, and then the, 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 the you know, Rua, like so that for people that don't know where that was coming from, if you count in Māori, Tahi Rua Tarufa Rima, so um, that's one, two, three, four, five, and if, if you look across Austronesian, you can find forms that are really obviously, uh, you know, cognate, they're, they're very, very similar. Satu, dua, tiga, empat, lima. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I can do it in Māori, you can do it in, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. in Indonesian? We can do a tag team. Yeah. Simple. I think it's, isn't it identical in Indonesia? Pen? It's pretty, I don't remember. I don't so I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll do Mara, you do. Okay. Yeah. Tahi? Is that, is that one? Yeah. Satu. Rua. Dua. Toru. Tiga. Fa. Tampa. Rima. Lima. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These languages are related, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, that leads me to a kind of, total, again, totally independent question, which is, I, I, I often talk in, in talks and things about the, right, the Taiwan to Madagascar and New Zealand thing. And, and I, I get asked all the time whether or not there are any, like, good, publicly accessible general audience books on, on that, right, trajectory. Like, I, but I haven't really found anything that I've wanted to recommend. Do you know if there's anything that... On the sort of Austronesian diaspora? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, the kind of uh, like broad history of the thing. On Polynesia, there's a really nice book by Pat Kirch and Roger Green called uh, Hawaii, but that doesn't go, that just goes f as far back as Polynesia. Right, it doesn't go um, all the way back to Taiwan. No, that would be... It's a book opportunity right there. Yeah, because... Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think Peter Bellwood ha has a book uh, some of it might, it wouldn't incorporate the m sort of modern genetics, right. um, but I think he has a book that might cover that. Okay, yes. Because cool. even David Abulafia's book on the, on the oceans, which is a great book in many ways, that it's a weird kind of gap, like he, he mentions, like it comes up a little bit, but it isn't as wholesome, as, as fulsome as, as I would like. Um, but that is a great book, I forget what it's called, but he has this like history of the world by, by way of talking about oceans, which is nice. Yeah. If I have a bit of a mission, it, it's that, you know, when, when people talk about kind of human cultures and that, we, you know, we, we don't just get all these European examples, we get some from the South, we get some from the Pacific. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Questions, please. No questions? Well, in that case, Russell, thank you very much. Thank you. Before the very last round table. Thank you.